Hello and welcome. My name is Carolyn Beeler. I'm an editor at The World. This is a live Q&A about the coronavirus pandemic, the Delta variant surge. Joining me is Bill Hannage, Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. If you have questions for him, you can post them on Facebook at Forum HSPH at, P at sorry, at Forum HSPH or at PRI The World, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is really presented by the forum at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and The World from PRX and GBH. And we're going to jump straight right in here to some questions on what's really a pressing issue this week, the coronavirus surge and the Delta variant with Bill. Uh, Bill, the New York Times reports that the U.S. has averaged more than 85,000 new coronavirus cases per week in the last week. That's more than a six-fold increase from a little over a month ago. And the Delta variant accounts for more than 80 percent of those new COVID-19 cases. Globally, we're seeing more than half a million new reported cases per day. What is the role of the Delta variant in driving the surge and what should we expect to see next? Where, where is this all going? So let me start by saying thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. It's thanks for all the questions. Um, what we are looking at now is really a pandemic which is substantially, although not entirely, driven by the Delta variant. The Delta variant, which emerged, actually, we may come back to this, it apparently has a most recent common ancestor around September last year, but it really started to make itself known when it was causing a large amount of disease in India. It is more transmissible. It appears, we'll come back to this, I'm sure, that it may be somewhat more likely to cause severe disease. But the most important thing from an epidemiologist's perspective, and that's where I'm coming from, is that it's more transmissible, which means it can get into people before they can be vaccinated and it can cause disease and you know, the large amounts of infections that you were talking about just now. So we are in a different phase of the pandemic, um, but fortunately we have some good tools to help us get through it. And one of those tools, uh, as we know, is masking. The CDC has changed its guidance on masking. It now advises even fully vaccinated people to wear masks indoors in areas with substantial or high transmission. I just checked the CDC's site, and that covers about 80% of U.S. counties as of today. What is driving this change in guidance? You know, what's really behind this? Well, the, the issue is that, as I said, Delta is more transmissible. It is it, it is increasing even in places which have relatively high vaccination rates. I mean, again, we shouldn't be surprised by this because we saw you know we saw Delta surges happen in the UK. We have seen Delta start causing surges in Israel, places with very very high vaccination rates, and higher than many U.S. states. So we shouldn't be surprised that Delta is doing this, and we shouldn't be surprised that in places where it is risking running out of control, that we're starting to see suggestions that masking and other non-pharmaceutical interventions should be used to supplement vaccination because we haven't got enough people vaccinated to exclude Delta. Okay. And and what makes Delta so much more contagious? We have a question from John um, asking, you know, what makes it more so much more trans transmissible and what precise mutation or gene sequence change, such as a spike protein, caused this? And then I'm going to add my own question on here, which is, um, part two of the question, does the variant cause more severe illness? So first, a little bit of the science is the question from John. So, John, that, I mean, it's a great question. I had a definitive answer for you. Um, what I can tell you is some of the things that we are considering. It's very, very difficult to take specific mutations and then pin a property upon them. You know, the history of infectious disease is littered with examples where people have confidently proclaimed that something, that mutation X means Y happens, and then they've turned out to, you know, have egg on their face. Turns out that's not the case. What does appear to be um, the case with Delta is that it can replicate very, very quickly. Um, so quite early on in infection, more quickly probably than with the previously dominant alpha variant, people can be shedding large quantities of viruses. The viral load is very high. And that happens quickly. And it is able to then transmit from those individuals very, very rapidly. So that means it could be something which is not actually in the spike protein. It could be something else. One suggestion I've heard is maybe it can replicate at a lower temperature more effectively, which means that it would be able to replicate in cells which are more close to the outside of the respiratory mm -hmm. tract. So these are all things which are being considered. The bottom line, however, is we, even though we don't know the precise mechanism, 
it is more contagious. We we can see that. That's the data show that. Now, some people claim that unless you have a mechanism, you can't really say it's more contagious. But I will comment that you know we don't have a mechanism for gravity, and things still fall. So um, we can look at the data and just note that it is more contagious and more dangerous. And then, Carolyn, you asked the question about the um, severity of the disease. This is actually a very difficult mm -hmm. thing to study. And one reason why it's hard to study is that when Delta arrives in a place, it can take over so fast that you have a very narrow window in which to be able to make like-for-like -like comparisons of infections mm -hmm. with Delta versus infections with whatever else is there. So studies from the UK, um, and in particular Scotland, um, have suggested that at the point Delta was emerging, it was about twice as likely to result in hospitalization as cases that were caused over the same period by the Alpha variant. And the Alpha variant was itself more likely to lead to severe disease than the founder virus. So the upshot of this is it looks as if the, it, the virus plausibly does com, cause more severe disease. Just to, bring, just to make it a little bit more complicated, you need to remember that in the UK, a lot of the most vulnerable people have been vaccinated. And so these infections are overwhelmingly among the unvaccinated population who tend to skew younger, which means that the data that we're getting from those age groups may or may not be a good guide to what happens if we see substantial outbreaks in older age groups elsewhere. Like there are quite a lot of counties in the United States where the over 65s are not vaccinated to a particularly high level. Mm, okay. Um, and, and, um, what, so, so, you know, we're talking about vaccination rates here and the risk to people who are vaccinated, does the Delta variant make these breakthrough cases when vaccinated people get infected more likely because it is, you know, more, more contagious or, or not? So that, so this is the first time we, we, the B word has come up, the breakthrough word, um, I think, um, and breakthroughs are really, we, we need to be careful when we talk about breakthrough because there are all kinds of different types of breakthrough infections. A breakthrough infection is like officially defined as a positive test result in a vaccinated person. However, a positive test result could be with a very low viral load, suggesting that the person's immune system has already controlled the virus. Or it could be, it could be high enough to transmit but controlled more quickly than in an unvaccinated person. So all of these things are possible. We also tend to see the more obvious breakthrough infections, meaning people who have symptoms and people who are close to known cases. And they may not be entirely representative. It could be that some, you know, it could be that many breakthrough infections are comparatively mild, perhaps not even noticed without somebody being aware that they had been exposed. And so we need to think very carefully and message very carefully how we handle this. I suspect that we're going to come to the question now of what breakthroughs mean for vaccinated people. And I think this comes back to the issue of masks that you were talking about earlier, uh, whether or not vaccinated people should wear masks, because it's clear now that even though being vaccinated makes it much, you, you are vastly, vastly protected against severe illness and hospitalization, and, you know, excellent protection. The protection against all infection is not as good, which means that you can be infected, and even though you may be much, much, much less likely to transmit than an unvaccinated person, it still could be possible. And because you are vaccinated, you might be feeling overly confident and perhaps make contacts that you wouldn't have made otherwise, which is one of the reasons why masks are sensible, because masks are very good at preventing transmission from an infectious person. So masks will protect vaccinated people, you know, more from getting any sort of infection, while the vaccine is going to most likely protect you from getting a severe infection. That's right. That's right. I mean, the vaccine is like the single like, best thing that anybody can do to protect themselves and others. Um, but it's not the only thing. And masks are a pretty light lift when it comes down to it. So their, their usage is something which I'm not surprised to see has come back. I mean, I can actually, I can speak personally. Um, you know, in Cambridge, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is where I live, um, I was wandering around um, going into stores, not wearing a mask um, at the end of June, while in the full expectation that I would be wearing a mask a month later because I could see Delta coming. Mm -hmm. 
and and given that, um, I do have some uh, sort of couple of rapid fire questions for you that are sort of news you can use questions from from people who are watching now uh, in terms of how they should be taking their their personal precautions. Uh, so I want to just pull those up. One question from Stephen: In view of Delta, is it safe for fully fully vaccinated people to dine inside at restaurants? So obviously, you'll be removing your mask while you're seated and eating at a restaurant. It, it depends on where you are. Remember, if you're fully vaccinated and you eat indoors in a restaurant and you become infected, then you are not likely to suffer any very, very severe illness. On the other hand, I would think in that circumstance about perhaps the other contacts I might make. If I were, if I knew that I was going to be um, perhaps in contact with somebody who was unvaccinated and vulnerable. There are a lot of people, for instance, who are immunocompromised. There are a whole bunch of people who have not been able to receive the benefits of vaccination. And those are the ones that a large Delta surge is going to place at risk. So it is responsible to be doing these things to try and limit the opportunities for transmission. The risk for you personally is not very high. On the other hand, the risk of a large Delta surge to your community could be pretty high. So my advice there would be, if you can eat outside, why not eat outside? After all, we've got a period at the moment where in a lot of the country, you can eat outside and that's not gonna be so in a few months. All right, um, so outside if you can, and think about your, your contacts, who you're gonna be exactly, in yeah. contact with in terms of transmission. All right, so another uh, you, news you can use question, let's see, um, from email. Um, do you advise individuals who are fully vaccinated to consider themselves safe and at ease with others who are not vaccinated, but in good health for casual social encounters? So having coffee, so a vaccinated person, uh, you know, grabbing a coffee with an unvaccinated person, what's, what's the risk there? Again, if you become an, if that unvaccinated person infects you, I mean, actually, let's, let me take a step back. Let's think about risk because human beings are very bad at thinking about risk. Um, we tend to, we tend to talk about it in, and, and similarly, the use of the word safe. If you are vaccinated and you're having coffee with an unvaccinated person, you are much more likely to be infected by them than you would be by, by a vaccinated person. Um, because unvaccinated people are more likely to be um, infected, they are more likely to be shedding virus, um, and they are, so the opportunities or the, the likelihood of transmission from them is higher. The risk to you as a vaccinated person, um, provided, you know, assuming you don't have issues with other comorbidities and the like, the risk to you as a vaccinated person would be very low directly. However, you could be contributing to spread. So again, if you're going to, if you want to do that, um, I would say meet outside, you know, it's a, get your coffee, um, put on a mask, go into the place, get your coffee, and then just sit around outside chatting with your, um, chatting with your friend. I mean, as a, you know, an example of this, again, I was recently in South London where there has been a huge Delta wave and I saw an old friend of mine. He was vaccinated, but you know, I would do the same thing. Um, you know, this is a kind of advice that I would give to other folks um, if they were trying to meet. We reduce the risk of anything happening by meeting in the middle of an outdoor area. Um, we sat six feet apart and there was a stiff breeze going between us. And he just commented at one point, this is a perfect way to meet an epidemiologist during a pandemic. So again, there are all of these things that you can do, which will reduce the likelihood of transmission occurring. But remember, if you're vaccinated, you have already done the most important thing that you can do to make yourself and your community safe. So you touched on two more topics that we have listener or, or viewer questions from. Uh, they segues perfectly to that. So I'm going to start with one on outdoor transmission from Jackie. Does the Delta variant increase the risk of outdoor transmission? Do we know? Well, the, the risks of outdoor transmission are low anyway. I mean, they are extremely low. Um, the Delta variant probably does somewhat increase it, but when, I, when I'm saying that, I don't want you to be thinking that you need to be um, uh, being like anxious when you're putting the bins out or whatever. Um, if you're in a crowded outdoor area with a load of people who are of unknown vaccination status, Masks would probably be a decent idea there, but most of the time, I think you're, I think you're cool um, because outdoor transmission is much less likely than indoor transmission. Having said that, 
obviously that makes you then look at the other side of the coin and say indoor transmission is something we, we are worried about. And I think that indoor mask use is something that will be extremely helpful to controlling Delta surges. Hmm. Okay. So if you're outside, you're mostly good. If you're in a packed in area, if you're going to a concert outside and you're standing up there near the front, you might. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not down with concerts. I've got to say, I'm not okay. down, down with loud, l- large concerts, at least at the moment, at least until we've got Delta um, substantially behind us. Even outside. Even outside, although they're much okay. better than inside. Okay. There are other things. That, there are other things that can be done towards this, of course. Um, but I mean, there are some limited studies earlier on in the pandemic where people would look at, for instance, the utility of doing a rapid test before you went into a concert, and that's a that's also a really good idea. And shows that even though we have vaccines, testing is still an important thing. All of these other all of these other weapons in our arsenal have not suddenly become useless. Mm. They are still useful, and they can take a risk and make it lower. Um, and then the other question that your previous response so segued perfectly into was one from Adam on the UK. You were mentioning you were just in, in the UK. Um, you know, the UK, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think they saw a giant spike in these Delta yep. cases and then a pretty fall, a pretty steep fall away. So it was a big precipitous, you know, wasn't it? Yeah. there. Precipitous. What does that suggest about what does it suggest about the course of the Delta variant in the US, if anything? Is this a is this a variant that burns hot and fast and then goes away? Or is that a more specific to the UK? Well there are there are some there are a few interesting things here and it brings back to the um it actually comes back to India because in India you could see that Delta declined very quickly as well eventually, even though we have a far less good picture of the pandemic in India because of issues with testing and surveillance. There is actually an interesting control within the United Kingdom because the pandemic waves in England and Scotland, which are actually separate countries, are not the same when it comes to Delta. I was actually expecting there to be a slowing down of um, the Delta pandemic in the UK as schools closed because schools um, are, have been an extremely important source of transmission there. There's been very little mitigation. Um, kids, I mean, it's a sort of, it's a gathering that you, that you cannot avoid if you want to have education going on. And so a lot of transmission occurred within those, in particular high schools. And the other thing that happened is that there was this big soccer tournament, Euro 2020. And Scotland, um, Scotland's peak was two, three weeks before England's. Scotland went out of Euro 2020 two to three weeks before England did. England made it all the way to the final. Scotland went out in the group stage. Scotland's schools also break up for the summer vacation about two to three weeks before England's do. Mm. So you have these two sources of super spreading events which are, which are present and then suddenly curtailed. And that, and that contact network changes. So mm. you asked about the message for the United States. I think that what that illustrates is that Delta can be controlled by relatively small changes to the contact network and the opportunities for transmission, which it is offered. And that may, and I want to point out this point, you know, I always try to point out when I'm talking about stuff, which I know are facts, stuff which is um, kind of informed speculation and stuff which is, you know, still speculative. I want to distinguish between facts and speculation. An observation that I and others have made, which is quite hard to explain, is that if Delta's origins lie in September last year, why did it take so long, if it has these extremely contagious properties, to make itself known? And it is speculation, but I would suggest that some of the contact networks that were present over that early period may have been different. And that's important because it hints at ways that we may be able to control it, even even beyond vaccination. Because a lot of the a lot of the world has not been vaccinated. We had another question, and I'm going to look up who it's from in just a second. Um, but kind of that goes into that about schools and and what should we be thinking about? Many school districts across the country have committed to reopening in the fall, um, you know, with masks for for those who are able to. But you know, kids under 12 can't get vaccinated yet. So, what are you thinking about in terms of best practices for for schools in terms of whether that's safe to to return and any practices that parents can be thinking about to keep their kids protected? Well, I think you have to ask exactly what it is you want to achieve. Do you want to achieve um, no infections among kids? Do you want to achieve no transmission within the schools? Because that's an important thing. I mean, you will have cases in schools because kids will become infected outside schools and then bring them in. What you can do in a school is take steps to try and limit transmission. And 
that has been done quite successfully in some school districts. Um, and there's actually work showing that multiple different interventions like ventilations and masking and so on can be pretty helpful. The issue is that we don't know exactly what Delta will do to that um, because Delta is more transmissible. You could see, I mentioned earlier, in the UK, the Office of National Statistics has been publishing regular um, random samples of different age groups. And you could see that Delta took off very quickly among the, um, the adolescents and high schoolers. Not so quickly among younger kids. And that's always been the case because the, the under 10s, the younger children produce less of the receptor that the virus uses to enter cells. So they are less likely to be infected, even if they can be, and they can transmit, but they're less likely to. So there may well be different things which are appropriate for different age groups. And of course, it will also depend on the state of the pandemic locally because of the fact that the, the more infections there are in the community, the more introductions there will be from the community to schools. But as I've said before, it's a very difficult situation. It's one which is going to lead to some very difficult decisions. Those decisions should be made on the basis of the best scientific evidence and while thinking all the time about what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Because there is going to, you do have to balance risks of transmission with risks to education. If you're in a situation where more than 90% of people in the community have been vaccinated, the consequences of transmission among children, even if it does happen, are not likely to be anywhere near as grave as if a smaller proportion of the community have been vaccinated. Hmm. Okay. Um, I just want to take a pause here uh, as we're about uh, most of the way through this chat, just to reintroduce ourselves. I'm Carolyn Beeler. I'm an editor at The World, the public radio program. I'm speaking with Bill Hanage, uh, at the, an epidemiologist at the T.H. Chan School uh, at Harvard. And we are taking questions from you on Delta and the COVID surge on The World and the forum's Facebook pages. Um, we just had, we're talking about schools and schools reopening. We had a, a couple of questions on that that came in through those channels. Um, and then I, another quick sort of news you can use question for you, Bill, um, from Amy. Is there any data on Delta having increased capability of surviving on surfaces when compared to previous strains? Early in the pandemic, we were worried about surfaces. Now we know we don't need to be so worried about that. Does a Delta variant change any of that? Um, I'm not aware of any specific um, evidence on that. Um, as far as I can, as far as I can tell at the moment, the majority of the greater transmissibility of Delta is pinned upon it just having higher viral loads rapidly growing early on in the in infection. That rapid growth, incidentally, could imp could be relevant to some of the issues with breakthrough infections or breakthrough infections, which we already covered as being a mixed bag between very mild to rare severe ones, but they are very rare. Um, because the immune system takes a little while to get its boots on. So if you've got a very, very rapidly replicating virus, you could get a few rounds of it managing to um, copy itself before the immune system wakes up and stamps on it. And there is actually evidence from Singapore showing that viral loads in vaccinated people collapse more quickly than in unvaccinated people. Mm. Sorry, I got off topic there. Um, <laughs> but I, want to, I want to come back to the surfaces. To surfaces, yeah. This is um, this is a mode of what we call fomite transmission. Fomites are the things that you touch and then you touch somewhere else. It's why throughout the early part of the pandemic, I was scratching my face with my glasses and stuff like that to avoid touching my face. Um, there, that was in the early stages of the pandemic advised because of the fact that we didn't really understand very much. Um, about exactly the modes of transmission. It's become clear now that fomite transmission is much less of a big deal. It's not that it cannot happen, it's just really not where the action is. The action is much more around the issues of the, uh, you know, the droplets or aerosol spread, which comes from having contact with a person who is at that point highly infectious and shedding a lot of virus. Hmm. I have a, a personal question here uh, coming from me. Um, so I kind of want to talk about bigger picture, sort of what's what's the what's the end game here in the U.S.? You know, we have 58 percent of those who are eligible for vaccines in the U.S. are fully vaccinated. But according to an AP poll that was done a few weeks ago now, 80 percent of American adults who aren't vaccinated said that they were they would definitely or probably not get vaccinated. Um, you know, the rate of vaccination has picked up in the past few days, but you know, where do you see this going with this highly transmissible Delta um, Delta variant? You know, a lot of vaccine hesitancy here in the U.S. Like, 
what are we in for? Well, well, nobody, nobody in a pandemic should be offering hostages to fortune about saying exactly what's going to happen. And so, I mean, we can, we can see a little bit out, but beyond that, we have to, it's a little bit harder to read. Um, one of the things that Delta means is that it is very transmissible and without you know, quite strong action, it's going to be everywhere fairly quickly. I mean, we have seen this you know, not uh, in other places which are less well vaccinated. We have seen how quickly it can take off. Now, it's reasonable to suggest, given the dynamics we're seeing at the moment, that before terribly long, everybody in the country will have either been infected with Delta or vaccinated. And given the choice between being infected with Delta you, or being vaccinated, it's much better to be vaccinated, even if you end up with a breakthrough infection, because the vaccines are good at preventing severe illness. So you're going to have a much less bad bout with it if you are vaccinated. So, I mean, that's what's happening looking forward. Now, I know that sounds scary, but I want to make a couple of um, additional comments. The proportion of the population that are vaccinated will have a major impact upon the nature of the surges that accompany that and the resulting demand upon healthcare. In the UK, they have, they have had, I think they just posted their highest death total for three months, but relative to the number of infections, it's not been huge. Yes, there has been strength in the NHS. Yes, more things have been delayed. Uh, that's the National Health Service. There have been procedures delayed. It has produced a greater strain than would have been the alternative. But the vaccinations have altered the connections, not removed the connections between cases and deaths, but has altered them. You cannot really translate that to the US because we're using not the same vaccines. The vaccine coverage is a very different. Um, uh, we in particular have a higher proportion of older vulnerable people unimmunized. Um, we want to redouble our efforts to get those people immunized, but also to remember that the worst possible Delta surge is one that comes at you really fast so that everything happens at the same time, because that's the point at which you're going to make it that much more unlikely that those people who are going to be badly affected will be able to evade the virus. And that's the reason that public health folks like me are recommending going back to mask use and stuff like that to supplement vaccines in order to slow down that surge in order to, you know, flatten the curve has gone a bit out of fashion. But if we can manage to make sure that all these things don't happen at once, then it's a lot better. You can think about it. I mean, this is a this is something which we talked about way back in the start of the pandemic. If you were in a family, would you want everybody to be down with flu at the same time? Or would it be better if it kind of goes in order so that one person can take care of the others while they are sick? So it's it's a, it's not unlike that. And we're still here with Delta because, you know, because the pandemic is a very long term event and it's going to be with us still for some time. And I, I made a comment. I want to come back to this because it's a comment I made to um, someone, a reporter at The Times a few days ago, and it's worth reiterating. We are in a worse situation than we would have been if Delta never happened. But we are in a much better decision, much better position than we might have been because we have vaccines. And that has, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Thank you for that. Um, another um, question coming in, um, you know, we were talking a lot about what the Delta surge means here in the U.S., where, you know, a good significant um, number of people are vaccinated. That's not true all around the world due to availability of the vaccine. Uh, we had a question come in um, on one of our Facebook pages, the World or the Forum. Uh, what does this stage of the pandemic mean for the COVAX rollout and the rest of the unvaccinated world? Um, you know, I think you could take that question in two ways. You know, what is the Delta variant going to make and mean in places that are much less vaccinated here in the U.S.? And is there going to be any impact on vaccination availability or vaccination rates due to the Delta variant? Um, yeah, I can see. And I think that the, the concern is, as I said earlier, that because Delta transmits so well and is so quick, that it will infect people before we are able to vaccinate them. I think that the 
it's not so much it's not that it will necessarily directly affect the COVAX rollout, although it is plausible that in places with a very rapid surge, it could be delayed because some of the people who are doing the vaccinating or who are participating in it are themselves sick. Um, it does suggest that we should redouble our efforts to get those vaccines into people as quickly as possible, in particular those who are most, most vulnerable, because Delta, is, Delta comes at you fast. And there are enough places now that have seen that, so that we should be able to, you know, we, we shouldn't need to be arguing that case. I've said before that for the unvaccinated parts of the world, Delta is little short of catastrophic. Um, that doesn't mean that there is nothing that can be done. And I think that we have to come up with, uh, we, you know, we have to redouble our efforts at vaccination. We have to consider again those non pharmaceutical interventions, which I mentioned earlier. I mean, there is that hint that. Delta prospers in particular contact networks. So if we can do something to stand in its way, we can get more people protected before it reaches them. And I've actually got a little, um, it's not even submitted to a journal yet, but we've actually done a little bit of modeling in my group, which indicates that even for a variant like Delta, if you can just get people vaccinated quickly, the number of people that you can protect is really, really huge. So the variant may be different, but the advice and the public health messaging is similar. If 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 continuing to evolve, which is the vac getting a vaccination is the best thing you can do to protect yourself and your community. Yes, yes it and is. Flatten the curve. We're coming back to that. Yep, it's all the, we're playing the greatest hits. <laughs> um, so we're running a little over. We have tons of questions coming in. So we're going to go about ten more minutes with Bill here answering uh, a bunch more questions. Um, there's a question from Abby, again, another one about the UK, this one about uh, vaccine dosing and scheduling. Can you speak about the evidence that the extended dosing schedule used in the UK for Pfizer may in fact have resulted in improved immunity and whether this may be responsible for the large differences in vaccine efficacy seen between the UK and Israel? So if you want to explain a little bit about what's, what Abby meant here with the extended dosing schedule and then, you know, if we know anything about what that means for vaccine efficacy. Yeah, indeed, Abby. Because um, while you are and you are impressively on top of this, um, this is one of the uh, it's one of the more niche corners of the pandemic. Um, it all goes back actually to AstraZeneca's um, mishap during their vaccine trial when they accidentally gave some um, one of their subgroups a lower dose and found that there was actually surprisingly effective. It was the most effective subgroup in the vaccine trial. But that was eventually pinned down um, to being because of the spacing between the vaccine doses. Um, now, Pfizer and Moderna, it's a few weeks, whereas AstraZeneca, they pulled it out to a longer period, like up to 12 weeks. And the issue that happened, the reason why Pfizer and Moderna did it short was because they wanted results quickly not because there's a magic thing at those dates. There isn't really, and I, I want to point out, I'm not an immunologist, so I'm quoting my immunologist friends here. Um, now, my immunologist friends assure me that there isn't actually a real epidemiological uh, immunological reason to think that spacing out doses is going to make it worse. In fact, it could plausibly make it better. And so when the UK um, started vaccinating in the face of the alpha wave, because they had a huge alpha wave. 70% 70, 70 of their deaths happened post their first bloodying experience with the virus. Um, and so it, facing the alpha wave, they made the decision to get as many first doses into people as possible. And it was one of the boldest, and in my view, best decisions of the pandemic. They've, you know, I've criticized them where I think it's due, but that's one of the bolder and better decisions. Now, looking back at that, you can see that it seems that there's a sweet spot, perhaps for Pfizer, of about eight weeks between doses. Now, be that as it may, sweet spot, perfect vaccination, sure, we, rather than worrying about perfect vaccination, we want to have some vaccination, sort of obviously. Um, but the question that Abby asked whether or not this was explained some of the differences between vaccine efficacy observed in uh, the UK and Israel. Um, I actually think it's down to the study design. Um, I think that if you are doing a study design, we counted, we, we, we mentioned different breakthrough um, categories of being very mild or more severe, symptomatic, et cetera. If you are designing the study slightly differently, you will get slightly different answers. And I think that the data that has come from Canada, in fact, is probably the 
best design study that I've seen. So I think my my view at the moment, and this is this is my um, sort of integration of all of the data that I've been seeing over the last few um, weeks, is that vaccine efficacy remains really very good against severe illness and death and hospitalization and death. Um, the differences between studies may be explained by multiple factors, but that bottom line remains true. Um, and just as a just as a follow-up to that, one thing I've learned only this morning is that Israel is now considering, or at least maybe even implementing, a third boost dose for the older population because they're starting to get some hints that vaccination or that immunization protection could be waning in the oldest age groups. And and I just want to illustrate that point a little bit. You're saying that you know most of the people who are hospitalized are unvaccinated. I think the latest is right. like 97 percent. Is that right? That's right. The vast majority of people who are hospitalized are unvaccinated. So, um, I mean, there's also, you, you've probably seen a lot of stuff recently in which people say, oh, but whatever percentage of these cases were vaccinated people, vaccination doesn't protect you. You have to consider what would have happened in the absence of vaccination. That's what you have to, if, if you imagine a town in which 100% of people were vaccinated and there was a little outbreak of three people, um, 100% of them would be vaccinated, but it would be a tiny outbreak. Whereas if more of them were unvaccinated, you'd expect the outbreak to be larger. Um, a similar thing that can be said is that, you know, um, the great majority of shoplifters are right-handed. It doesn't tell you anything. It's just the fact that the majority of people are right-handed. And because the majority of people are vaccinated in a lot of places, when that happens, you expect a large proportion of actual cases to be among vaccinated people. It's just that they're in, the total numbers are far fewer than they would have been. Got it. Okay. Another question about vaccines from Anne Marie. Um, my understanding is that vaccines can be developed in months using mRNA platforms, as we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. Is it feasible to develop vaccines for variants or would we just be chasing our tails? Um, it's a great point. You know, the mRNA vaccines do have this kind of plug and play aspect to them. Um, it's um, it would be possible to do that. Um, the question is, of course, you want to know what the I mean, there are a few more other things that go into that. I pointed out previously that it's not actually clear whether Delta is evading immunity precisely. Um, it doesn't have some of those changes in spike that everybody um, has got terribly excited about. Um, you, I mean, I don't know how much, I don't know how into the weeds you've got with this, Carolyn, but there was the E484K mutation, which got nicknamed Eek. Um, that's not in Delta. Delta doesn't have that. Um, it's not, D Delta may owe some of its properties to just being very able to replicate super fast. And that is something that is not going to be necessarily protected against by a redesigned vaccine. You also want to think about the, uh, you know, the type of protection that happens with the immune system. And there's a lot of studies that need to be done on this. Um, people are considering combining vaccines in different combinations in order to try and give a wider range of immunity. And we should be seeing the results of some of those pretty soon. But I will point out that the mRNA vaccines um, do do pretty well against most against pretty much all of the variants that there have been around, even the beta variant, which was the one that people were most concerned about. I will note, however, that beta, which was the one which emerged in South Africa, has not really taken off anywhere else. So for all that people get terribly anxious about immune evasion, it, it's not, you need more than immune evasion in order to be able to be a successful virus in the current pandemic. Another viewer question. Um, do we know anything about um, how the Delta variant impacts long COVID um, and if it makes it any more likely in folks who are vaccinated? So we know we're not going to get severe or much less likely to get severe illness if we're vaccinated. But what about the other lingering effects that, that we have? That's uh, a increasing brilliant effect? question. And I wish I had, I wish I knew the answer. Um, we, we don't know that at the moment. The comment I will make um, in general about long COVID is that it is a very poorly characterized syndrome. It's real, it's absolutely real, but it's 
But to assess the nature of it, we need to compare it with similar syndromes because chronic sequelae following an acute viral illness are not, is not uncommon. We've seen it in lots of things. It's just that you don't normally have this many people having an acute viral illness all around the same time. So the precise nature of the um, of long COVID and how serious it is in both vaccinated and unvaccinated people with Delta and without Delta is something which is deserving of much, much further um, good, proper study. And I think we need to, um, you know, I think funding bodies should be enthusiastically looking for people to you know, throw money at in order to define this better. And we're going to wrap up in just a few minutes here. I wanted to end on a note that may be a little bit bigger picture, maybe a little bit hopeful. Um, I'm wondering if you look at sort of where we are, maybe specifically in the U.S., after what's happening, what's happened this summer with some cases in, in Provincetown on the Cape. And, um, you know, if, if you looked at where we are today, a year, even a year and a half ago, what would your assessment be of, of sort of um, where we are in terms of, of, you know, vaccines being available, their uptake and, and where we are with the Delta, Delta variant? Wow. It, yeah, it's a, it is a mixed bag, isn't it? But if you think about, so for anybody who doesn't, hasn't heard about it, there's been a lot of stuff recently about the quite large outbreak in P-Town, um, Provincetown. Now, there has been questions as to whether or not um, the contact patterns that were being made there are representative in general. But let me just say that if you had offered me the prospect of there being an amount of vaccination by this stage this year, that you could have an event like that which occurred in Provincetown with very much mixing people, with few interventions beyond vaccination in many of them, and that the resulting outbreak would lead to, yes, 900 plus cases, but only seven hospitalizations and no deaths. I would be thinking that's a, that's a much better place than many of the alternatives. So it's not that it's, we are not in a situation where the pandemic is over and we're going to have to be taking evasive action to prevent the worst consequences of Delta for quite a while yet. However, it is important to remember how far we have come. And with that in mind, I'll note that the United States just managed to pass that, the, the, the Biden administration's goal of 70% vaccinated. So we are getting there. And we are finally seeing um, inroads into some of the hesitant communities across the South as they look at Delta and they think, oh, I don't want this. Um, the final thing I want to say about that, though, people talk a lot about vaccine hesitancy. We must not forget the issues of vaccine access, because there are some people um, predominantly in communities which are not able to take the type of action the, to, to avoid infection that others are, and they're often in essential um, industries. They need to be given access to vaccines. We need to be able to get that into all of the vulnerable people. And if we can do that, we'll have a better summer, fall, and winter, because Delta's not going to go away unfortunately. Unfortunately, the virus is not going to be eradicated. However, with sufficient amounts of immunization and sufficiently savvy policies, we are going to be able to keep it in a situation where we would be better able to control it and we would be able to avoid the big, big spikes and damage to healthcare that we have seen at various other stages. And indeed, in fact, we are seeing even now in places like Florida. So some hope, but also some caution there in our yeah. last I mean, thought from Bill. And it's, it's, it's not, it's not, you know, um, people, and people, unfortunately, in the pandemic, they, they want folks like me to come in and say, oh, it's easy, just do this and everything will be fine. No, it's, it's literally an evolving situation. And we have to, and we have to, you know, um, we have to tailor what we are recommending and tailor the advice accordingly. The pandemic is not over, but we are in a much better place than we might have been, or indeed much of the world is. Thank you for that, Bill. I think we will leave it there. We have had lots and lots of questions, so I'm glad we were able to keep you for a few extra minutes to answer some more of them. Um, that concludes our discussion today. Thank you, Bill, for fielding everyone's many questions. Thank you. Uh, Thank you to everyone who asked questions as well. Yes, absolutely. There were a lot of good ones in there that we didn't have time to get to, so I apologize for that, but we did get many of them. 
Um, this Q&A has been jointly presented by the Forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and GBH. You can view the full discussion on the Harvard Chan YouTube channel and our Facebook pages at Forum HSPH and at PRI The World. Thank you so much for joining us today.